Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, a look back at a bumper week of racing. The tours of Swiss, Belgium, Slovenia, the Route d'Occitanie, Giro Next Gen, and the Mountain Bike World Series from Leo Gang. It is with a heavy heart, though, that I start this week by paying tribute to Gino Maida, who passed away last Friday. I think we'll all remember where we were when we heard the tragic news coming out of Switzerland and from his team Bahrain Victorious. It's hard to process news like that, isn't it? All of a sudden, the things that we place importance on day to day in our lives seem instantly so trivial. The thoughts of what his friends, family and colleagues are going through brought me to tears on Friday. And if it hit me that hard, having never even met Gino, how on earth are they going to cope? Our love and condolences go to all who knew him, but particularly those closest to him. Uh, the tributes that came flooding in from the cycling world all described a man who was, yes, a talented cyclist, but first and foremost, an intelligent, thoughtful and funny human being. He cared for the environment and donated his own money for a cause close to his heart during the World Set in 2021. I personally always really looked forward to a post-race interview with Gino Maida. He was just such an engaging person to listen to. All of which makes it so incredibly sad that he's no longer with us. He did a lot in his 26 years, but you know he would have done so much more on the bike, but especially off it. Rest in peace, Gino. You will be sorely missed. Friday's stage at the Tour de Suisse was shortened and ceremonious. A sombre peloton rode into Oberville Lielli, led home by Maida's teammates at the race, Philip Matiojuk, Fran Miholovic, Nikias Arndt, Peo Bilbao, Jonan Price Peterser, and Antonio Tiberi. Understandably, the team decided not to take the start for Stage 7 on Saturday, along with a number of other teams and individual riders who could no longer think about racing. For those that did remain, the GC times on that stage were taken with 25 k's to go, after which those who wanted to race, raced. Remco Avenpool was determined to put on an exhibition in Maida's honour, determined to be able to dedicate a stage victory to him, which is exactly what the world champion did. With an individual time trial on the eighth and final day, though, there was still a GC battle to be had. Matthias Schelmosa of Trek Segafredo started the day in yellow, but with Juan Ayuso breathing down his neck and Avenpool himself at just 46 seconds, the Dane couldn't have been feeling particularly comfortable as he rolled off the start ramp. And if he wasn't worried then, he probably was if or when he heard about the times that Ayuso was posting en route. The young Spaniard blitzed around the course, bettering the times that Avenipal had set just before him. Ayuso took the stage, his second of the race, and it was quite the performance. Another sign, if we even needed one, of what he is capable of doing over the course of his career. He's still only 20 years old. But it wasn't enough to take the overall win. Skelmos's time at the first check might have been a worry, but from that point on, he flew. Third on the day, nine seconds behind Ayuso and just a single second behind Avenipal was enough to claim overall victory by nine seconds. And that is the biggest win of his career so far and the first at World Tour level. Uh, Skelmosa is only 22 and it meant that Avenipal was the oldest rider on the final podium of the race at the ripe old age of 23. Now I haven't looked at the stats but I would imagine that must be one of the youngest ever overall podiums at a World Tour level stage race. Uh, the other stages are won by Felix Gall of AG2R, taking his first pro victory on stage four. Skelmosa himself, who went into the lead of the race after winning stage three. And Binyam Gemai, who took his second win of the season on stage two. Nice to see him back at his best after that nasty crash at the Tour of Flanders back in April. In the women's event, we have had two stages so far, both of which have been won by SD Works. Blanca Vash outsprinted Arlenis Sierra from a small group on the opening road stage, whilst Marlon Rusa did what she does best one day later, winning the individual time trial. And that marked the team's 21st win in a row. 35 for them so far this year. It really is quite remarkable how well they're doing this year. I mean, a lot was expected of them. They're the best team in the world right now in the women's peloton. But even so, they have massively overperformed. So what do we have for you on GCN Plus this week? Well, not quite as much, which I'm personally quite thankful for. I need to taper down my viewing to get myself ready for the Tour de France after all. But we do have some racing for you. On Thursday, it's the Men's and Women's Time Trial National Championships in France. On Friday, we have all the action from the British Criterium Championships. Saturday, the Elite Women's National Championships of France and Spain. And Sunday, the Elite Men's of France, Spain and the Men's and Women's of Great Britain. 
We've also got some mountain biking and BMXing for you this week, so check the app for all the details and see what territory restrictions apply. On Wednesday, I'm going to be back on the world of cycling, discussing the main contenders for this year's Tour de France with Ian Field and Max Stedman, whilst our documentary this week, Out Tomorrow, goes into the rivalry between Andy Schleck and Alberto Contador. One that defined an era in many ways, so here is a sneak peek. Alberto Contador was an unassailable force in the late 2000s. By the age of 26, he had completed the Grand Tour Triple Crown. It was all about, I'm going to win, I don't want to be on the podium, and that made him a very dangerous opponent. But then, Andy Schleck came along. There's the move there by Andy Schleck. Schleck has gone. And he was a young kid, and on his first ever training session with us, better than almost all of us. They would clash in what was one of the most intense. Schleck's chains off. Contador's uh, gone. This is terrible. Controversial. Yo arranqué. Estaba arrancando y luego él tuvo el problema mecánico. Action-packed fights for the Tour de France yellow jersey that we have ever witnessed. Alberto and Andy, they sparked off each other. They made each other better. We had some fantastic contributors to that film, so make sure you check it out if you can. Uh, just before I move on, a quick promo for our shop, because we have a whole load of new limited edition t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, bottles and more ahead of the big races taking place in France starting in a couple of weeks' time. So if you'd like to get your hands on any, simply head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. On to other races now, and we'll start in Belgium, where Mathieu van der Poel was back to doing Mathieu van der Poel things. On day one, he was in a strong breakaway that was ultimately caught, albeit after he'd picked up a hefty chunk of bonus seconds in the golden kilometre. But despite all his efforts, despite being caught with just 10 k's to go, he recovered enough to turn his attention to last man lead-out duties, duly delivering Jasper Philips to the win. A crash involving Philipsa and Ewan put them out of the picture on stage two. Fabio Jakobsa taking advantage of that, winning the sprint in front of Van der Poel. There was a little bit of an upset or surprise in the time trial on stage three. Suren Valenschul proving himself to be far more than just a pure sprinter. He beat last year's Tour de France opening stage winner Yves Lampart by 12 seconds, and it was enough to launch himself up to second on GC, just a second behind Van der Poel. Now, it's hard to work out on stage four whether Van der Poel was on a mission to win the stage and the race overall, or just to get a solid training ride in over the hilly terrain. He attacked with about 35 kilometres to go, quickly pulling out a 30-second advantage. That was brought down significantly by Trek Segafredo, but then the chase broke down and the gap went straight back up. The Dutchman held on to take what was just his third win of the season so far. I could have sworn that he'd won more than that, but I guess when your other two wins are both at monuments, you don't need to worry too much about volume of victories. Second that day was Thibaut Nace, who's quickly establishing himself as a force to be reckoned with over all sorts of terrain, because one day later, he was finishing third in the bunch sprint behind Jakobsen and Philipsen. Uh, Jakobsen would have been very pleased to get that head-to-head -head win under his belt ahead of the upcoming Tour de France, where it's been confirmed that he will be Sudal Quickstep's designated sprinter. In Slovenia, it was another sprinter, Dylan Kronewegen, who was having it all his own way at the start, beating Bauhaus on stage one, Moschetti on stage two. And he might have had a third pop at the cherry on day three, were it not for going off course with a large number of riders as they neared the finish line. Ida Schelling took advantage of that, outsprinting Grunewagen's teammate Luka Mezgec to the line. Schelling's jubilation, though, was unfortunately quite short-lived. Uh, the riders in Slovenia had started racing that day before news of Gino Maida had been released and were only told that they had lost one of their colleagues after they'd crossed the line. It was another very sobering moment to watch, I've got to say. Uh, the GC started to take shape the following day, and it was looking very good for the Italian champion Filippo Zanna of Jaco Alula until this mishap on a right-hand bend. Thankfully, Zanna was unhurt and able to continue, and all was not lost for Jaco Alula. In fact, it couldn't really have turned out much better for them. His younger teammate, Jesus Peña, flew past Zanna and cruised to his first ever pro win, whilst behind, Zanna had still done enough to move into the leader's jersey because he outsprinted Ulisi and Fortunato to take the six bonus seconds for second place. There was still some climbing to be dealt with on the fifth and final stage, though, and it was a day that Matti Mohoric was determined to win. He put in multiple attacks on the final climb, which only Zanna was able to follow, and then dropped the Italian on the descent. 
The two did come together on the run into the line, but in the sprint to that line, the result was never really in doubt. Mohoric taking the win, his first of the season so far. Here's what he had to say after that stage. We committed today to the plan with all the team. We rode this one, all for Gino, and uh, we didn't care about the result. We just wanted to leave it all out on the road. I was focused on my own performance and I just wanted, it, I just wanted to do my best effort on, uh, on the last climb. Uh, and then on the top I saw it was just me and uh, Filippo. I uh, tried to took advantage of the descent, but it was not quite long enough to make a difference. So I waited for him in the final. I, I thought that because he's not suited to this type of finishes, he's going to be on his hands and knees for the final flat six kilometers. So I, I did big pulls, but I also recovered in the meantime, uh, and I was focused on the stage. And uh, at the end, I managed to win. So yeah, of course, I dedicated it to to the to my friend Gino, and uh, yeah, I think he would be happy for us today. A beautiful win and a very fitting tribute from Mohoric, who also moved up to second on GC behind Zana with Ulisi in third. Moving on, and there was a second win in a row at the Route d'Occitanie for Mike Woods of Israel Premier Tech. The Canadian had been beaten by 19-year-old Lenny Martinez at the CIC Mont Ventoux a few days before the stage race started, but managed to make the front group in the crosswind stage on day one, and then won, won the toughest stage of the week on day three. That despite some heated arguments over workload with Christian Rodriguez of Arcaire Samsic. Marine Vandenberg was the first leader of the race, beating Viviani to the line on stage one, although the Italian was later relegated to the last place from the group for what was deemed to be dangerous riding in the sprint. Uh, Jason Tesson of Total Energies took his sixth career win one day later, whilst the fourth and final stage was won by Simon Carr. The Brit from EF Education Easy Post had got away with Moraine's brother, Lars Vandenberg of Groupama FDJ, and just about managed to beat him in the sprint to the line. And finally, on the road at least, the Giro Next Gen. Uh, the race overall was won by Johannes Storner Mittet, who won the Queen stage atop the Paso Stelvio and never relinquished the lead after that. He follows on in the footsteps of Pidcock, Ayuso and Vlasov, plus many others, as winners of that event. Uh, Norwegian will move from Jumbo Visma's development team to the full World Tour squad next year. At that stage, up the Stelvio, went viral on social media, and unfortunately, that was not because of Storna Mitet's win. A large number of riders at the rear of the race were caught on video holding onto team cars, police motorbikes, and anything else that would give them a helping hand to the top. 24 riders and four sports directors were removed from the race and took no further part. Amongst the other stage winners were Lucas Naruka, who's had a brilliant year so far for Trinity Racing, and Jan Christen, the 18-year-old former junior cyclocross world champion, who's going to turn pro with UAE Team Emirates next year. Second on the GC was the Irishman Darren Rafferty of Hagen's Berman Action, with Hannes Wilksch of Tudor Pro Cycling in third. Over to mountain biking now, because it was the next round of the UCI World Series in Leo Gang last week. Uh, full replays are available to watch over on GCN Plus, so close your ears now if you don't want any spoilers. In the XCO, it was a second win from three races for Puck Peterser. She finished alone in front of an Austrian pairing of Mona Mitterwalner and Laura Stigger. Lars Forster took his fourth career World Cup win in the men's race and his first since 2019, whilst last week's winner, Nino Schurter, could only manage 21st. There was plenty for the locals to cheer for in the downhill, though, with Austria taking the win in both the men's and women's events. Valentina Hull put in the perfect run in the final to win by over four seconds, whilst Andrea Cole's victory over Loic Bruni in the men's was a more slender one, but a win still a win. In other news, Arno De Mar is set to leave Groupama FDJ at the end of the season, having spent his entire career with them so far. This was his 12th full year with that team, which he joined in 2012. De Mar is, understandably, very disappointed not to be doing the Tour de France this year. He was told that he hadn't made the team last week by Marc Maggio, but apparently he had been told he would be, be doing it at the start of the season, and so based all of his plans around the Tour. Instead, the team will be focused on David Godou and Thibaut Pino, and you've got to say, there's a little bit more pressure on them to perform without Demar around. It's going to be very interesting, in fact, to see which team picks him up in 2024. There will also be no Tim Malia at the Tour de France this year. The Belgian champion who joined Soudal Quickstep at the start of 2023 was not given the nod over Fabio Jakobsen. Right, that is all for now. Stay safe, everyone, and I'll be back with you this time next week.